مولانا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل لقطة من لساني يفقه قولي أمين Before we begin, if, any, if you have cell phones, please put them on vibrate or silent, um, not only during the khutbah, but also during the prayer. Um, we praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as He is most worthy and deserving of all praise. We ask Allah and we ask Allah alone to guide us, to prevent us from being misguided and from misguiding others. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless His noble prophet Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi Whomsoever Allah guides can never be misguided and whomsoever Allah allows to be misguided or allowed to be in error will never be guided except by the permission and the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whatever good comes of today and my khutbah is from Allah and any weaknesses or deficiencies are mine and mine alone. In this blessed month of Rabi al Awwal, uh, which is the sacred month or one of the months that we celebrate because it is connected, inextricably connected, with our beloved Prophet Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam, because of his noble of, because of his noble birth in this month, I want to talk to you today briefly about our relationship to the Prophet ﷺ. Because oftentimes when we examine the seerah of the Prophet, his life and legacy, we do so by a particular context or we do so with a particular lens. Uh, moreover, when we talk about the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, his normative practice, that which he did, that which he said, that which he uh, tacitly approved of in his presence. This is often the definition uh, of the sunnah. But that definition is rather or largely legal. Yani the usuli, the, uh, the scholars of usul will examine the sunnah with that lens. But for us as lay, as lay persons, and for those of us who seek to emulate the Prophet وسلم, in our lives, that legalistic definition alone does not do justice to what the Sunnah should mean and should be in our lives. Legal definitions will only get us so far. And if we approach the sunnah only through that lens of legality, that is, what is considered sunnah, what is considered to be the normative practice, or this action you do is not wajib, but it is sunnah, it is mustahab, it is recommended because it is the sunnah. These examinations only get us so far because it does not allow or it does not necessarily mean that the persona and the legacy of the Prophet وسلم, is being internalized in our lives. It only gets us so far. And if we are to delve, if we are to forge a relationship with the beloved وسلم, with Allah's Habib, with Allah's beloved and our beloved, then we must move beyond simply looking or examining his life or his sunnah through purely a legal lens. And when I say that we examine the sunnah of the Prophet through a particular context, what I mean is that we look at his life of 63 years 40 or 23 of those years were spent as a Nabi, as a prophet, but truly his entire life was an exemplar and an exemplary mode of conduct. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رُسُولُ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حسنة. That verily in the legacy of the Prophet, in the Prophet, 
sallallahu alayhi wasallam, you will find a uswatun hasana, a beautiful example, a beautiful model, model to emulate, a formula of success, a methodology of success. And so, first and foremost, when we look and we examine the seerah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, or his sunnah, that should be our approach. That his, mo his model, the model that was left for us, that is contained in the books of ahadith, that is contained in the books of sunnah, that is contained in the books of seerah, his life and legacy, it should serve for us as a blueprint by which we model our lives, by which we conduct our affairs, by which we engage with one another, by which we, by which, which we engage our family members, our brothers and sisters in faith and in blood in our family, our children and our grandchildren, our wives, because this is the legacy and the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He is a model and a mode for us to emulate and follow in all parts of our lives. And so the first context that we should approach the seerah and the sunnah is that we should see his life as that blueprint, as that formula of success, as that formula for attaining God's pleasure, of living a life of virtue and of purpose. That is what we find in the seerah and in the sunnah of the, of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So methodology and formula for success. But also when we examine and we look at the seerah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it's easy to focus on the trees and forget about the forest. What do I mean by that? Right? We've heard this analogy or this expression the forest and the trees, right? A forest is an aggregate of all of those trees. But if you focus only on one tree, then you're going to miss the grand picture. You're going to miss the broader scheme of things. And it is a blessed, it is a blessing of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in that his life was expanded in, a, in 23 years of Nubuwa. He was able to achieve many lifetimes of life and of legacy in, in a mere 23 years, right? 23 years, I mean, if you think back 23 years in your life, many of us are old enough to do so. Seems like a flash in the pan, right? It's just a blink of an eye. It seems, where did the last 20 years go? 23 years of Nabuwa that we study and we examine and we delve over, 23 mere years. But in those years, he did so much. And that is because the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was blessed. It was expanded. The inshira that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala talks about, like, that Allah expanded the heart of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. One of its meanings is that his life was expanded. It was expansive. His model, his legacy, his example that he left is broad, is universal, is expansive. It's not limited to a man who lived in the 7th century Arabia. It's not limited to a man who belonged to a certain clan or a tribe in 7th century Arabia, in Mecca or Medina. It was a man that was a universal example and guide for us to follow. So his life was expansive. It was universal. And so when I say the forest for the trees, what I mean is that if we examine any one particular aspect of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you would think that the Prophet did nothing but that. So if we examine the ahadith, the sayings and the statements related to the life of the Prophet, his his model of character, his uh, actions and his words, his statements and his teachings, the ahadith. If we focus on the ahadith that speak to his relationship with his wives, his relationship with his family, 
One would think that the Prophet was nothing more than a domesticated individual. That all he did was, all we know of the Prophet is that his life with his family. Because we have so much, there's so much material that focuses on that particular aspect of the Prophet Wasallam. And while there are many examples for us to follow in that particular example, and if we focus only on that, one would think that the Prophet was nothing more than a family man. He didn't have a career outside of the home. But if we focus on that one particular aspect, we lose sight of the broader picture. And so yes, the Prophet Wasallam was an exemplary model for us to follow spiritually, uh, socially, politically, all aspects. But it, if we focus on any one particular aspect, we lose sight of the broader picture. And so if we examine the life of the Prophet ﷺ, we, we should do so not only in keeping this idea of a methodology and a blueprint for us to follow, but also in understanding that we cannot focus on any one particular aspect alone and negate or forget about the other aspects. And it is my contention, and you know, this is subject to debate and, you know, dis and discussion, but this is why we have so many different uh, methodologies or expressions of faith in our community. I belong to a particular uh, minhaj. I belong to a particular approach to my Islam. I think we should be involved politically. I, I think that we should uh, be involved civically. Others say, no, we should be focusing only on our spirituality and focusing on correcting ourselves, righting our own wrongs, fixing what lies internally within ourselves before we focus on political action or social action or social revolution. And it is because they are focusing only on particular aspects or, re or, for, or, or, or being uh, focused almost exclusively on those aspects rather than looking at the life of the Prophet وسلم, as this expansive and this universal guide that we should follow. And so when we examine the life of the Prophet وسلم, there are certain salient features that no matter what we focus on, whether it was his life as a head of state, whether it was the aspect of his life as a family man, or how he treated his companions, those that, those that spent time with him, those that were blessed to be in his company, in his presence, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we see certain qualities that are unmistakable, that carry over no matter what aspect of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that we're looking at. First and foremost, the first salient feature that I think that we should be mindful of is that as Aisha radiallahu anha described the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam as being a walking Qur'an, as being a Qur'an brought to life. Because if we place the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam in our broader theological context, in our belief and our relationship with Allah, what the Prophet ﷺ represents for us and to us is a human embodiment of what it means to be a true Abid of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To be a true Abd of Allah, Abdullah. To be a true servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To submit wholly to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is what the Prophet is. He was the walking Qur'an. His example, no matter what aspect of his life we focus on, was an embodiment, was a human manifestation of the Qur'anic ethos, of the Qur'anic way to engage, of the Qur'anic way to be. And so if we want to internalize the message of the Qur'an in our hearts, then we look no further than the example of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam.
because he showed us of what it means to be a human embodiment of the Quranic message, of the Quranic ethos. Every aspect of the Prophet is a walking Quran. It is a human manifestation of what it means to submit truly to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so that becomes then the yardstick or the barometer by which we should measure ourselves. Are we living up to the prophetic example? Are we living up to the prophetic legacy? Second salient feature of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, brothers and sisters, no matter what aspect of the life that we focus of his life that we focus on, is that he was an embodiment of love and compassion, of rahmah. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that we have sent you wa ma arsalnaka illa rahmata lil alameen. That we have sent you, O Messenger of Allah, solely as a mercy, as a, as a, a model of love and compassion for all of creation, for all of creation, human or otherwise. All of creation, the way the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam conducted himself with his companions, with his family members, with strangers who encountered him, with even those uh, objects of like animals and trees and vegetation the way he lived his life was one of love and compassion truly an embodiment of mercy and so when we examine our own lives the way in which we treat one another the way in which we conduct ourselves with our children with our grandchildren with our nephews and nieces, our family members, our friends, our relatives, our co-workers at work, strangers that we encounter at the grocery store. Are we a representation? Are we truly an embodiment of that rahmah and that love and compassion that the Prophet ﷺ always, without fail, was able to demonstrate for us? And so that becomes the second most important part of his legacy is that he embodied this rahmah of no matter where he conducted himself and no matter who he was engaged with. The third and third salient feature and probably the last one that we'll be able to focus on today is that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was never, was never perceived nor did he ever perceive himself to be an outsider, to be a foreigner, to be not from amongst his people. And again and again in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to the Prophet as a messenger, right? As a messenger, as an unlettered Prophet who emerged, who came from within his community. The Prophet was always concerned and was, was always struggled with how the lives of those that he was encountered with, that, that, who, whose lives he encountered, and those that he lives, lived amongst, he was always concerned with their welfare because they were a part of his community. They were a part of his ummah, truly, in the most global sense of the word, his community of people. And so he never perceived of himself as an outsider, nor, and this is where it's important for us to reflect on, was he ever seen as an outsider? Even his most ardent critics, right? And he had many during his life. Even those who fought against him, who raised up arms against him, who oppressed him. None of them ever claimed that the Prophet ﷺ did not have that community's best interest at heart. They, may, they, they certainly disagreed with the message he was teaching or with the way in which he was conducting himself or the community was conducting itself. But that community or the Prophet himself was never seen as being a fifth, as being a fifth column, as being an outsider, as being alien to that landscape, to that ethos, to that, to that uh, milieu, to that generation that he lived in. He was always seen as belonging to that community. 
And so if we have a role, and this remains true of not only the Prophet Wasallam, but of all the Prophets that were sent before him, in that if reform and if reformation is to come to a community and is to come to a society, then that reform and that reformation comes from within that community, never from outside of that community. It doesn't come from outside of the understanding of the cultural context of that time. And so if we seek to bring about positive change in our community, as Americans, as people living here in this community, in this land, then not only must we perceive ourselves as belonging to this land, but that others too must realize and must understand that our intents and our purposes are not in anything other than the best interest of this community. That we care about the life and the legacy and the well-being and the sanctity of our home. We are concerned with the sanctity of our communities. Right? And so civic engagement becomes important. Yes, certainly. But even opening our doors to our neighbors in times of need, in having relationships with our neighbors, with our co-workers, becomes imperative, becomes integral as a part of seeing ourselves as agents of positive change in America, in the Bay Area, in California, because we belong here. We are part of this community. And we are not alien or foreign to the aims and the objectives and the welfare of this community. And so if we have a challenge before us, and that challenge is great, I'm not underselling that or overstating the, the amount of, the, or, or the fact that we have an uphill battle. Because the, whether it's the media, or popular culture, or the ways in which Islam and Muslims are portrayed to the average American. Islam and Muslims in particular is seen, are seen as being alien and foreign. As not having America's best interest at heart. As being quote unquote, enemies of the people, right? And so we have to work towards that. And the way that we work towards that, yes, we can have grand objectives and purposes and civic engagement is a wonderful way to do that. But opening the door for our neighbors, knowing who our neighbors are, our neighbors knowing who we are, breaking bread with them, our coworkers, our fellow classmates that we engage with. How are we perceived by those who don't know anything about Islam and Muslims? That is the challenge that we confront. Because that is what you as an individual can do. Yes, we can talk about broad plans and grand plans that we should do as a collective, as a community. And that is a conversation that we should have. But what about us as individuals? What about us as individual people that come into contact with people around us? What can they say about Islam and Muslims based on how you treat them, based on how you act with them, based on how you engage with them. That is the challenge that each and every one of us has and an opportunity that each and every one of us has. Because no matter what you do for a career, no matter where you live, I guarantee that you come into contact with people who either have no idea what a Muslim is or what Islam is or worse, they have very negative feelings about what Islam and Muslims are and what, and what they represent. And so it is up to you as an individual, as us as individuals who engage and encounter them to change their attitude about Islam and Muslims. That is the life and the legacy of the Prophet That is his sunnah. That is his example. That is the life and the embodiment of the Prophet was to create a social fabric where you opened up psychological space, where you allowed Islam and conversations around Islam and what Islam offers to the betterment and to the welfare of society to open up psychological space so that people are willing to listen to what you have to say, to what you bring to the table. 
That is what the Prophet was engaged in in 23 years of Nubuwa, was to create a space or to open up psychological space so that his message could be delivered to hearts and, mind and minds that were ready and, 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 and willing recipients of that message. And so we have to endeavor towards opening up social and psychological and cultural space right here in our communities. And the way we do that is to the basic, the basic encounters that we have with our neighbors, our coworkers, our community that we live around. So I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not only in this, in this blessed month of Rabi al Awwal, but also throughout our lives, allows us the opportunity and truly gives us the tawfiq to engage with one another in a way that is beautiful, in a way that is built on love and compassion and trust. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala truly make us all true representatives of his deen. Allah, may, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless this community collectively and individually. Aqulu khawli hadha wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum wa akhirun da'wana alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وآله وصحبه وسلم يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتنا إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلنا به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يتي الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما أما بعد ربنا لا تواخذنا إن نسينا أو أخطأنا ربنا ولا تحمل علينا إسرا كما حملته على الذين من قبلنا ربنا ولا تحملنا ما لا طاقة لنا بوعف عنا واغفر لنا وارحمنا أنت مولانا فانصرنا على القوم الكافرين يا مقلب الخلوب ثبت قلوبا على دينك اللهم إنا نسألك رضاك والجنة ونعود بك من سقيتك والنار سبحان ربك رب العزة ما يسفون والسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين وعقيم الصلاة الله أكبر الله أكبر